Last week, I covered the command design pattern. If you haven't watched that video, I've put a link in the description of this one. Today, I'm going to take the command pattern to the next level by rethinking what is the ground truth of the application. Is that the state? the balance in the account, or is it the history of transactions? Because changing that ground truth, going from, let's say, state to the history of transactions, is going to have a huge impact on how you design your application. And ultimately, by thinking about these things before, you will take better design decisions in the end. I've written a guide with the main things that I think about when I design my software, and you can get it for free at ariancodes.com slash design guide. It contains seven steps. You can apply it immediately to what you're working on and then hopefully that will help you make better decisions and just save you time. So get it at ariancodes.com slash design guide. I also put the link in the description of this video. Before I start changing the code, let's do a brief recap of last week's example. So in last week's example, I implemented the command design pattern. I started out with basically two files. There was an account file that contains a account data class, contains a number, a name, and a balance, and simple methods for depositing and drawing amounts. We had a bank, which basically manages the accounts that belong to that bank, and it has a create account and a get account method. And then I added a transaction protocol that has an execute method, an undo, and a redo method. And in particular, the execute method, that's the basic structure of what a command should have. And then there is a controller that allows us to execute transactions. I added undo and redo behavior to the controller by defining these undo and redo stacks that keep track of where we are in what we've executed. And then basically the undo and redo move transactions around from the stacks and execute them or undo them as necessary. I had a few examples of these transactions that are here in the commands file. So I had a deposit and a withdrawal, a transfer, and finally also a batch transaction that allows me to execute multiple commands in a row. And if one of those commands fail, I can also roll it back. So that's where we ended up last week. And it's a good start. It shows that if you make commands an object, you can do different things with them like undo and redo or schedule them, etc., etc. And then finally, in the main file, I create the bank, I create a controller, some accounts, and then I execute a few deposits and other types of commands. So let's run this and you see we get this kind of result from the example. When you consider what data is stored in this example, then on the one hand, you have the bank and the accounts that contain the balance. On the other hand, you have the undo and redo stack of transactions that you need in order to undo or redo things. The problem with this approach is that it's pretty hard to get a list of past transactions. And as a banking user, you definitely want that. You want to see what you did in the past, or perhaps you're under a criminal investigation and then the police wants to see what you did in the past. So we need to have this. One way to do it is basically add another array where we store the history of transactions. But that's yet another thing you have to keep track of when you apply undo and redo operations. Another problem is that it actually introduces redundancy. If you maintain both the list of past transactions and the account balance, which one do you consider the truth? Because you can compute the account balance from the transaction history if you wanted to. In the current example, the account balance is clearly the ground truth because we don't keep track of the past transactions. So the other way to set up this application is that the account balance is not the ground truth, but the list of past transactions is. And that completely changes the way that you design this application. So let's change the example and turn transactions into the ground truth. The main thing that a transaction-based system allows you to do is to not execute the commands immediately, but do them at a later date and not have to worry about balances and stuff like that. And what it also does is that it significantly simplifies undoing and redoing because we're not storing the state, we're storing transactions. One thing that we're going to do, so this method is called execute. Well, that's actually not really what we're doing anymore. I'm just going to rename this to register because we're just going to register a new transaction in a ledger here. There we go. So now we have a register method. This has also changed the name in the main file, which is nice. What we're going to need, because transactions are now the ground truth, is a ledger of some sort where we keep track of the transaction history. So let's add that to the bank controller. So we're going to define a ledger. 
which is a list of transactions. And that's a field which has a default factory of list. There we go, we have a list of transactions, our ledger. The only thing, if we want to implement, undo and redo, we're going to need to add something extra to this. I'll show you in a minute what I mean. So basically we have our ledger and now in the register function, I'm not actually executing the transactions, but I'm going to simply add a transaction to the ledger. So we're appending the transaction and then I'm going to remove this stuff. So currently, if we just use the system in this way, well, we'd still have to execute the transactions to compute the balance, but we keep track of the transactions, of the, of the history of transactions. When you want to apply something like undo and redo, you need to keep track of where you are in this ledger. So as we have it now, you're, the history is always the entire ledger. But if you do undo, you actually go one step back and redo, you go a step forward. So we need a pointer a kind of index that tells us where we are in the ledger. So let's add that here. So that's going to be an integer that's just going to be the position at the ledger where we are. And initially the ledger is empty. So I'm going to, let's call this current. It's an integer. And let's initialize this to zero. So it basically points to the index after the last element. So there is no element now, so zero is just the end of the list. Because we now define the index of where we are in the list, whenever we add a new transaction to the list, like in this register method, we also need to update the current pointer. So we add one to it. But of course, you remember when we add a transaction in the previous version, we also cleared the redo stack. Because redoing things doesn't make sense if you add a new transaction to the ledger. So in this case, we also need to do that. And basically what that means is that we need to delete any transactions that are in the ledger after or from the current index. So let's add a line here that does this as well. So I'm going to delete ledger and then from the current index until the end. So basically, let's say you have um, a list of three transactions in your ledger. You do undo once, so then current points to the last element, and then you add a new transaction. Then you need to remove that last element because otherwise your transactions are going to be messed up. So that's what this does. This deletes everything from the current index until the end. And then we add the transaction and we set the current value to the last element again of the list. So that's register. Because we're doing everything in the ledger and with the current pointer, we don't need these undo and redo stacks anymore. And basically undo and redo now become really simple because the only thing that they're doing is moving, incrementing or decrementing what the current pointer is. So in the case of undo, if the current pointer is larger than zero, so it means it's not at the beginning of the list, right? Then we're going to decrement it. And this I can remove. So it just moves the pointer one back into the past. And redo is very similar. If the current value is less than the length, oh, I should type length of the ledger. So that means we still have room to redo things, then I'm going to increment this pointer. And this I can remove. So the ledger, which is the history of transactions, together with the current pointer, which indicates where we are in this history, so some things are going to be in the future, together determines what the state of the system is. And we're doing all these things, and I think that's really a mind-blowing aspect of a transaction-based system, we're doing all these things without actually executing the transactions. We're simply keeping track of the transactions that are in the history and future, and we have a pointer that indicates where we are. That's how simple it is. And what we can do now is now add a simple method. Let's add that here. That's called compute balances. And this is going to actually execute the transactions and then via that way, compute the balance. So what we're going to do, we're going to get each transaction that's in the ledger. But of course, we only want the transactions until now, until the current time. So that means we need to get the 
part of the ledger until the current index. And then for each of these transactions, we're going to execute them. So when we do this, this is actually going to compute the balances for us. So that's the bank controller. And this takes care of undo, redo, registering transactions, keeping track of the transactions. We don't need to change anything in the bank because it just manages accounts for the moment. The command itself now is also simplified because actually undo and redo is no longer necessary here because that's actually all dealt with in the controller because the ground truth is the transactions, the list of transactions and no longer the state. Undo simply means that we move the pointer one back and we simply don't execute that transaction. So that means that these two methods, undo and redo, we don't need them anymore. So I remove them here and from the commands, it's the same thing. So here also depositing, we don't need to implement an undo and redo method. So I remove this, withdrawal is going to be the same thing. There we go, transfer, this is going to be the same thing. No undo, no redo. And for the batch thing, it's the same thing as well. So I'm going to remove this here. And now the interesting thing is that even this execute method in the batch class, we can really simplify and just execute the commands. Because one, if one of the commands fails, we should not deal with that inside the batch, but we should deal with that outside. You could do it in a controller and simply throw an exception that, hey, this transaction, we can't execute it. So you have to do something about it. But the batch itself, we can actually keep it quite simple. So let me remove most of this code here, actually. And then we just take this and we move it to the right indentation. So execute, the only thing that it does is it executes all the commands in the batch. That's it. There's one more conceptual change. In the account class, we have a balance, but actually the balance doesn't matter anymore because it's the transactions that matters. Balance is the state. So we should probably rename this to something so that we know that it's a, basically a cash value that we don't worry about. So let's rename this to balance cash, right? And now let's also add a method here, clear cash, so we can actually clear it and that's just going to put the balance cash again to zero. Then in the bank class let's add a convenience method for clearing the cash of all the accounts. So we're going to iterate over all the accounts in the dictionary and we're going to call the clear cash method. And now let's go back into the main file. So we're registering these commands here. So if I run this, now of course, because it's simply registering the commands, it's not yet executing them, my balance cache is going to be zero everywhere. Let's add here a clear cache. So we're sure everything is put to zero. And then we're going to compute the balances like so. Put an empty line there. So now you can see you will get the right balance cash values. If I remove this withdrawal, oh, oh, that's not the type of comment I wanted to add. If I remove this withdrawal here, then you're going to see that my balance cash is 1500 euros here. So what I really like is that the way this works is actually completely different from a state-based system. Transaction-based versus state-based systems. In a state-based system, it's easier to view what the current balance is, because, well, that's the current state. In a transaction-based system, it's much easier to modify things on the area of the transactions, like undoing and redoing things. And at the moment, obviously, my cache solution is pretty rudimentary. You could make this a whole lot smarter, for example, by keeping track of which transactions affect which accounts. So you can only clear the cache of those accounts that are affected. You could add a mechanism that recomputes the cache in the background every couple of minutes or something. So you always have more or less updated balances in your accounts. So that makes it a lot easier to quickly display the account balance. What you can also do is have these cutoff points. For example, once a year, you compute the final balance of that year and you store that in a separate transaction, which is, a, let's say, initialize balance transaction and then that's your starting point and then you don't have to compute the 
thousands of transactions from when somebody was born till uh, um, till now or something like that. And you see banks actually do that as well. So there's a lot of way to make the system a lot smarter than I did in this particular example. Transaction-based systems are actually quite common. Not only in banking, like in this example, but also lots of non-destructive editing tools do this. For example, Final Cut Pro video editing program doesn't directly modify the original video clips, but it applies effects and transformations, etc., onto them, and then finally renders the result into a movie file. Those transformations that you perform on top of the original video files are similar to the transactions in banking. I also have some experience myself with applying the command design pattern. Not in banking, I'm not a financial programmer or anything, but I did research at the university for quite a long time on computer animation. And the way you edit and work with animation files is also often non-destructive. So you have your base animation file, which is recorded using a motion capture system or keyframed by an animator. But then you want to transform it, you want to map it onto a different character with different skeleton dimensions, or you might want to move the character around in the space or change the height of the stairs that the character is walking on and those kinds of things. So you transform the animation data and you apply those transformations using a command pattern structure. To me, this really shows how powerful this design pattern is and how widely used it actually is. In general, 3D modeling tools are a great example of where you can apply the command design pattern. So you have your textures, your models, your animations, everything. You apply all kinds of effects and transformations. And then finally, you render everything to a file if you're creating a movie. In that sense, rendering is very similar to computing the balance caches in this banking example. And you can often even render in different formats, different quality levels, different output formats, and so on. So that's another point of flexibility that the command pattern offers if you're using transactions as the ground truth and you compute the state as a cache value. And this is the reason why I spent two videos on the command design pattern, because there is a big takeaway, which is that if you're designing software, you often have the tendency, at least that's in my case, to take the state as the default ground truth. Think about what happens when you take transactions as the ground truth. Perhaps it's a better fit for your design and it's going to make your life a whole lot easier in the end. Let me know in the comments if you've worked with transaction-based systems before and what your experience was with it. I hope you enjoyed this second part. Give this video a like if you did. Consider subscribing to my channel if you want to watch more of my content. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you next week.